Hi, and welcome to video 3.C, where we're going to not only solve trigonometric identities, but we are also going to use the sum and difference identity. So, first of all, let's recall solving trigonometric expressions. Really, this is what I asked you all to Google in class, and this is understanding our inverse trig. Today, I'm going to talk about it with regards to the hand trick. So, if you have a different method, you need to figure it out for yourself. At this point, we've spent many weeks on this concept, so I just need it to be a recall instead of a brand new learn. So um, how do we solve trigonometric expressions? This is kind of the basic method that I use when we do our uh, hand trick. Um, you, if you're solving standard, you fold your fingers, you count the fingers, you figure out which quadrant you're in, and then you figure out whether you're positive or negative. If you're solving in inverse, then you do the opposite, but you're going to count your fingers, then you're going to fold them, then you're going to figure out whether you're positive or negative, and then decide what quadrant that is. If this was a regular solve of an inverse, you need to make sure you've got your domain restrictions accounted for. If you are using it as an operator, like today we will use it, then you're not actually needing domain restrictions. You have to restrict based off of the information itself, whether it's the period restriction for sine, cosine, cosecant, and uh, secant being 0 to 2 pi, or the tangent, cotangent restrictions of 0 to pi, and so you kind of work from there and then deciding whether your information is positive or negative. So just a review for that hand trick, this is the hand, this is how you determine positive and negative, and finally these are the formulas for that hand trick. So if I were solving this question using my hand trick, then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fold my finger of pi over 3. Then I'm going to count, and that depends on the formula itself. For cosine, I'm counting from the top. So I count one finger, and I plug that into the formula, and ta-da, there is my beginning of my answer. The next thing I have to do is figure out whether or not my answer is positive or negative. That's the purpose of the pizza and astica step, the um, deciding which quadrant you're in and whether it's positive or negative. Well, cosine of pi over 3, if I cut up all of my quadrants into thirds, then this becomes uh, one-third and two-thirds. Technically, this is three-thirds, but that just is one, four-thirds, and five-thirds. And I know that for my uh, value of positive, or sorry, of pi over three, that we're actually in this quadrant right here because that's one-third. And so since everything is positive, A, all are positive, then my answer has to be a positive square root of one over two, which is just a positive one-half. All right, can you do one? So could you pause this video and attempt to solve this question? Because I'm about to show you the answer, and if you can do this forwards, then hopefully you're working on moving backwards. All righty, welcome back. Here is that answer. It was undefined, right? Because cosine of pi over 2, if you're using this formula, you flip your hand, and so pi over 2 is here. If I flip my hand, the square root of 4 over the square root of 0, well, anything divided by 0 becomes undefined. Alrighty, let's look at this question if I'm solving inverses. So I'm dealing with an inverse, so I'm going to count my fingers, but I have to count it based off of the formula. So I compare it to the formula. The twos are going to disappear, so I'm counting one finger from the bottom. I fold the next finger. So now I'm at pi over 6. But I have to astica and pizza, so I have to figure out what's going on. If this is an inverse question normally, I would restrict my domain. Now I'm dealing with quadrant 1, negative quadrant 1. Po uh, one half is positive, so it's actually positive pi over 6. Cool, that's a recall. How are we using this concept today, though? So if I wasn't using it as an inverse but as an operator, so I am doing something to the question. I'm not originally solving arc sine. I'm originally solving sine, and I'm only using the arc or inverse to finish the solve, then that domain restriction goes away. So I'm still going to do everything else. I count, I fold, and I determine that I'm starting at pi over 6. But this time, there is no domain restriction except from the question itself. So sine has a natural domain restriction of 0 to 2 pi. That's just the period of sine. You learn those when we learn to graph trigonometric functions. So you knew sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant were all part of the 0 to 2 pi. Tan and cotan were our weirdos, and they went from 0 to pi. So I ask myself, where is 1 half positive? And then in, in that instance, what uh, fractions are those? So I can do my fractions real quick. If this is 0, 6, then this is 1, 6, 2, 6, 3, 6, 4, 6, 5, 6, 6, 6, which is just 1, 7, 6, and finally 11, 6. So then I ask myself, where is 1 half 
because it's one half is positive. Where is sine positive? Well, A and the S. So my answers are pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. And I throw in that plus 2 pi, ooh, there should have been an N, plus 2 pi N to account for your coterminal angles. All right, can you do one? So before you do this question, I have a hint. The square root of 3 over 3 is kind of a scary one. I purposely did this one because this is the one kids struggle with the most, tangent, and specifically this question. So I will ask you to recall that if you unrationalize or re-rationalize, however you want to see that, by multiplying again by the square root of 3 over the square root of 3, you end up with 3 over three square roots of three, which ends up being one over the square root of three. So I've already re-rationalized or unrationalized, however you want to see that. I've already worked it backwards. Now it's at this point where you can set it up and solve it for yourself. Can you do one? All right, welcome back. Here is your answer. So you should have gotten down to pi six and then realized that you also had quadrant T or the third quadrant where you needed to answer as well. So seven pi over six was your other answer. Now moving forward to today's actual lesson. So solve by isolating expressions. These two examples, we most of these examples we've already kind of previewed in class. Here is one more session for you to see it. Also, you have access to this 24 seven now, and then you have your video journal questions to answer as well. So. First things first, how do we solve? Well, you want to get your trig on one side and your numbers on the other. So no matter what you do, that's what you want to end up with. Even if it's multiple trigs in factored form, that's okay as long as it's set equal to zero because we can split these up and set both equal to zero. All right. So peanut butter and jelly guy tells me you might see this differently and that's okay as long as we get to the same standard answer we're good to go so if you start yours a little different than I start mine that's okay all I'm asking you to do is catch the patterns so the first thing I do is figure out what to solve mean it means to isolate this x variable well to isolate the x I'm gonna first have to isolate cosine by itself so I'm going to combine my 5 cosine and my 3 cosine. Here's the first mistake I see kids do. They try to divide. But technically, if I can rearrange these or add in a 0, then this is a plus or minus. It is not a multiplication division, so I have to subtract it away. So I subtract. 5 cosines minus 3 cosines becomes 2 cosines. I'm still not isolated. I have that 2 to deal with, so now I can divide, and I end up with this. The final step is the step you guys struggle with the most is the inverse solve. So in order to get x by itself, I have to use the inverse. Here is my here is the finished solve for x, but can you finish the inverse solve? So that's what I asked you guys to Google for yourself, recall, learn. I gave you a brief example at the very beginning, but at this point, that is your prior knowledge you need to master. So really quickly going through it, I use the hand trick for learning's sake. Okay, if I count three from the top, one, two, three, then I fold the next finger, then I'm dealing with my pies over six. I can uh, figure out where square root of 3 over 2 um, is positive, and this is just reminding you, you don't need domain restrictions because it's a standard question where you're using an inverse as an operator, so only the question itself tells you what restricts it. So the period itself will restrict it, 0 to 2 pi, and finally, because the square root of 3 over 2 is positive, you're restricted again. So where do I know it's positive? In the A and the C quadrants. Now I can cut up my pizza and figure out that this was, if we're in the pi 6, then this was 1 6, 5 6, 7 6, 11 6, so these are my two answers, and that's where those answers came from. All right, I don't know how many more I showcase like this, or I might go through them quickly because, again, this is recall. This is something we spent weeks on. At this point, you have to know this on your own. Here's one more example for me to solve for you. Um, I'm going to move that negative sign over. Again, peanut butter and jelly guy is there to say you could have done it different, and that's okay. So I move the sign. Now I move the negative or the square root of 2, and now I can divide by 2. I am so close to finishing my solve for x, all I need now is the inverse. So I invert it, and I finish the solve from here. Okay, so it's going to walk you through it very quickly, but I can't pause too much on this information. So I know that it is negative in quadrants 3 and quadrants 4. If I cut my um, 
fraction up correctly, if we're dealing with the pi over 4, then that should be 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. And I always tack this on to account for our coterminal angles. All right, here is your chance, and the video ends here.